Cool. Can you can you hear me there? Yeah, it's fine. Cool. Um, so, yeah, let's start then. So first of all, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Julio. Uh, I come from from Berlin, from the cold Berlin, working on SoundCloud. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the publishing API and also continuous deployment and continuous delivery on Android. Um, I know that we have had like a, a workshop here for like the entire CI pipeline and everything. Can I just ask for a little, like to see the hands for how many people participated in the workshop? One person, two people, cool. Did you cover the, the publishing API? Did you go through it? Yeah, more or less? Oh, something happened. What's happening? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, something happened here. Try again. All right, okay, I guess it's right. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about continuous deployment. Um, in, the, in the conference, we have seen many talks already about architecture, testing, um, also integration testing, UI testing, accept test, acceptance testing with Espresso and everything. And I'd like to, I really like to understand more or less how the audience is uh, set at this, at this point. So before I start doing my gibbering here, like talking about everything, I'd like to also understand a little bit uh, how many of you already have an architecture app. So if you use any kind of architecture, like clean architecture, MVI, MVP, MVV, MVVM, any kind of architecture, could you please raise your hand? Okay, cool. Most of the people, that's, that's great. And is that, so how many of you test your code? Unit testing with JUnit or like most of you? Acceptance test or UI testing? It's getting, like the number is getting lower, okay. How many of you automated the distribution of your app? So like you have the APK and it's already going one person, maybe? No, more people? Okay, some people are doing it. That's cool. Um, and how many of you are, are doing that via the publishing API directly? None of you. Okay, so that means I can say whatever I want and you won't be able to correct me, right? Because nobody understands. I mean, I'm just kidding. Um, so before I go into the publishing API, I wanna do a, a little, uh, what's up now, it doesn't work. Theoretical overview about continuous deployment. Um, yeah, I'm gonna just throw Martin Fowler at your faces to begin with. Um, and what's the difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment? We see all over the place those terms, it's like a buzz, uh, term nowadays, um, and the main difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment is the fact that you, in continuous delivery, you are ready to push your changes to production, and continuous deployment, you do it. So the difference would be that when you have a pipeline, like C, uh, CI pipeline, like Jenkins or Travis or Circle CI, whatever you use, uh, you go through the entire steps, like to, to the all, all the steps until you have your tested and built APK, but you don't push it to production. You don't go to the alpha beta channel or like to actual Google Play Store. And on continuous deployment, uh, that's the difference. You would go this next step and you would automate the full process. Um, this, so this uh, methodology came actually for, from backend development, right? Where people would develop their monolithic applications or nowadays the microservices application and committing to master would immediately trigger a push to production. Uh, and my talk is more or less uh, on top of bringing that mentality also to Android development um, with, and, and the publishing API is, is the way that we're gonna do uh, this next step. So just, just to go through uh, the, the pipeline, you have your code ready, your unit test, it's already automatic, you, you have your integration tests, already automatic, acceptance tests, already automatic with Espresso or Robotium or whatever you use for UI testing as well. But then you have the APK sitting there and you have to update your Play Store, like the, the form is huge and sometimes you might um, commit, like make mistakes in, in the process. Um, I've worked in a company in the past um, that was um, developing a multi-label um, product, so an APK that was being shipped to many different clients and we had a single um, code base, like it was a base library and we shipped it to different countries with different brandings and different colors and different assets and blah, 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 and that's so on. And I remember we had a problem once um, that we pushed to, like we checked, <coughs> sorry, we changed the, the Play Store assets in um, Korea to use the Japanese language, the screenshot for the Japanese language, just because we don't speak Japanese where I come from. 
So we got like lots of reviews from our users, like lots of bad ratings about that because it was a human mistake, you know? Like if, if we had automated that step, taking the screenshot to the correct locale and pushing it to the store in the correct locale, uh, we, didn't, we wouldn't have this problem, right? But since we had this manual step in between, so this happened. Um, and, and then you can imagine, like, you can multiply the number of locales, also, like, number of devices you have if you target tablets. Um, also, if you, if you ship multiple different APKs, so if you have, like, APKs for different uh, CPU architectures, the thing, like, the number of combinations you have to maintain, it's really hard. It gets really big really fast, and the chance that you commit a, a mistake is really high. So automating this last step, I think it's the best way to, to avoid this kind of problems. Um, so, yeah, so instead of doing it manually, automatic. Um, okay, so, so then the first question I always uh, have been asked every time I do this talk and every time I discuss about continuous deployment uh, is bugs, right? So what happens if I do, like, if I make a mistake in my code and it's compiling, it's passing the test, but it's actually, like, it's actually a business rule problem or I introduced a bug that's, I don't know, charge, it's going to charge my users a million dollars instead of ten dollars. Are you still shipping that to production? So this tweet here uh, is uh, some guy from Twitter uh, asking Jazz Humble. Jazz Humble is the author of the Continuous Delivery book. Uh, he's one of the first uh, persons to, to introduce this concept and everything, and he's asking, so how would you recommend continuous delivery, or in this case, continuous deployment to a company that sees itself in their entry more risk averse? So like it's completely averse to risk. And the answer, I think, um, summarizes very well the concept of continuous deployment and also continuous delivery, is that if you are making a change in your code uh, that takes forever, like takes a month, or you're developing this awesome feature that's gonna save millions of lives and everything, but takes three months to be merged onto master, the chance you're gonna have a problem while merging that, or the chance you're gonna have a problem when you put that in production is really high. Even if you rebase your branches, you know, like we have like this practice of like, keep going back to the branches and people out there write GitHub bots to, to uh, notify you to rebase your branches on top of master. If you keep working uh, for a long time into what we call big bang releases and you suddenly put that into production, you are sure, like you, you must be sure that you're gonna have problems. If it's not a problem in the app, it's a problem that you're gonna have if you like, perform requests to your servers, uh, and then you don't expect the amount of requests, you might DDoS your servers or something. So um, the idea of continuous delivery and deployment is that you're always going to be delivering new value, like small, small, small chunks of value. Um, and this is actually going to uh, mitigate the, the chance you're going to have problems in production. Um, uh, something, something we use currently in SoundCloud that I really recommend you doing, and sometimes when I, when I talk about this, people get a little scared, is that we always merge, what is happening here? Is that we always merge to master. So if I'm developing a, a new feature, even if the code is still in progress, I'm still pointing my pull requests to the master branch. And when I, when I say this to people, when we say this to people, people are usually like, wait a minute, what are you do why are you doing this? Why are you putting stuff into master that's not done yet? Um, what we do there is that we have feature flags for everything. We have feature toggles. Um, now Firebase um, also has like the remote configuration tool that you can use to control those feature toggles remotely. We also have like a home homemade solution to to implement those feature toggles locally. So what we are doing is that we're currently toggling our features if if the work is still in progress. Let's say I'm working into like a new thing that's gonna bring like, I don't know, lots of money to SoundCloud, but it's not done yet. I'm gonna do an if else there. And if the toggle is on, then I'm gonna go into my code. But until this feature is complete, I don't, I don't turn the toggle on. That's the only, uh, that's the only difference. Um, and this makes me able to ship the code to master and don't have any problems with rebasing or merging or conflicts at all because I'm always merging small amounts of, diff of, of chunks of code to master branch and my coworkers are only uh, reviewing small PRs as well. Okay, so let's go forward here. Um, so the developer API. So let's say um, you have your APK being built and how do you automate this last step and send it to the Google Play Store. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the API, but first I need to introduce you to some concepts. This API is free up to 200,000 requests per day, right? Um, there, the, and it's also composed of three main groups of resources that you can access. 
The first one is the subscriptions and in-app purchases. So if you're a game developer or if you have like an app with in-app purchases and you want to do like a Christmas sale or an Easter sale or something like that, uh, you, can always, you can also control those via this publishing, what's called the publishing API via the subscription and in-app purchases uh, resources. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to go deep into this because the, the focus of the talk is to push the APK to production and alter the resources there. Uh, but it's, I, I just wanted to, f to point that out that it's still, this is there and you can always uh, use it if you want. The publishing API, which is, which is the core of the presentation, so you're going to use it to create and modify the listings, upload the APKs, uh, promote APKs, automate, automating the promotion of APKs from alpha, beta, stage rollout, and also production tracks. You can change the screenshots, you can change what's new, you can, like, there are many resources, and I'm going to show you later which resources are those, uh, that you can change via this API. Uh, and lately, like last year, Google also added a new API to the group, which is the Reviews API. And the Reviews API is great, it's awesome, because you can automa automatically read the reviews from our users via this API and also respond to them, so you can reply uh, to those comments. Um, in SoundCloud, we built, on top of this API, we built a, a Slack bot that goes into our uh, reviews, read them, and put them into buckets, kind of like um, aggregating the, the reviews by subject. So like if someone is complaining about our player, or if someone is like giving like lots of, uh, we have like lots of compliments about this or that feature, we can group them and we can take decisions on top of this API directly via Slack. So we also have notifications, we can create like bots. It's pretty much automating everything on top of what we get from the Play Store without having to access the Play, <coughs> the Play Store. Um, oh yeah, so a last detail is that Google, so. Google has been developing this uh, API for the last two or three years. Um, and the first clients that they have released uh, were a Java and Python clients. The, the API is a REST API, so you can build whatever uh, in whatever language you want. So if you want to build like in Kotlin, you can do it. If you want to build in Cobol, good luck. Um, and this last year, they also announced a new client, an official client that's using Ruby. It's still in alpha, but it supports uh, all, of the, all of the features that the other two support. Uh, just for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to go with the Java implementation because that's what we use the most here as Android developers. But I have used already the Ruby one, and it's it's awesome. It works perfectly. And but like as I said, it's just a REST API, so you can access it whatever. Like if you want to write PHP, if you want to write any other language, you can still do it. Okay. So since this is an API and a robot is going to access your production. Uh, code, like your what's, your, what's, what's on your Google Play console, we have to give it permissions, right? So before we actually write the code, we have to configure some stuff on the Google Dev console. I don't know if you have already used any of the APIs that Google provides, so Google Drive, or in this case, the, the Google Play Developer Console API, but we're going to go really quick here on how you configure this thing and give access to the robot so it can change the data that's there. Okay. So if you go, so the Google Developer Console, uh, the URL is there on top right, the top right. Um, you're going to go there. It's a really quick form. They have like, I don't know, like 50 or 60 APIs that you can choose from, from like since Google Maps to Google Drive to whatever, like many different things. You can just search for Google Play Android Developer API, click there. And on the left, right, I should have put maybe the panel there. But on the left, you're going to see a panel that says credentials. We're going to have to create a key for your robot to access uh, your project, right? Um, you're going to click on this thing, create credentials, pick the service account key to enable the server-to-server -server configuration, the communication. And a key like this is going to be generated. It's a JSON key. Um, all of you who want to take a picture of the SoundCloud key, just go for it. Our password is there. Um, and you can access our production. I'm just kidding. Um, so, so it's a JSON key, and, but the important part of this, of this key are those three parameters, the private key ID, the private key, and the client email. So the client email is more or less the identifier of your robot, and we're going to see it later how we use this thing on Google Play. Uh, and the private key ID and the private key are the password. So I'm going to pick this private key, which looks like this. And I'm going to save into a file, which is going to be my PEM file. It's just any, like any other text file. You take the, the key, paste it over there. 
And it's a MD5, it's a hash that you're going to keep as a key. It's a private key, so you have to make sure you never, 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 never share this with anyone. As I said, this is not my actual key. I don't use this thing. If you want to copy and paste this thing, it's not going to work, so go for it. Right, now on the Play Store, if you go into the, so I'm pretty sure every, like every single one of you know this uh, console, the Play Store, where you have access to everything. If you go to the little bar on the, on the left, there's this gear where you can have settings for your account. So you can have like either a personal account, so in my case it would be my personal email, or a company account that you share the apps of your company. Uh, and you're going to give API access to one of the projects that you created on the other console, on, Google Play, on the Google Developer Console. So keep in mind, those are two different websites. Um, yeah, the URL is always on the top right. I'm going to share the slides later so you can access it easier. Um, but your, the project you created previously, it's going to appear here, and it's going to have a, a link button over there, and all you have to do is to click this button. So this is going to give access from that project to this um, to this app on the Google Play um, Developer Console. Right. So if you scroll down, you're going to see also the email. In that case, the email I chose was continuous deploy test at AppSpot, whatever. Uh, and this is the same email, the same identifier that we had on the other console. So this is the link being made by the two consoles. And um, as, as you can see here, like the identifier is there. And then my key, my private key, is going to be used by the robot to talk to the API when I write my code. That's all you have to do. Yeah, I'm glad the internet is working because we have like GIFs. I love animated GIFs. Cool. So finally, let's go to the Android publisher. So we did all the configuration, everything that we had to do to set a robot and make it like handshake with Google Play and access the data there. Let's write the code to actually change stuff. So those are the resources. And this is all my ability on Microsoft Paint is here. Right. I'm going to just keep looking at it for a minute. Yeah, all of, the, all of the resources that you can access via the publisher are there on that, on that, um, on that picture. You can change the, the testing groups that you have. So if you want to give uh, access to a new Google Plus community to your app to be beta testers, you can do it by the API. Listings, images, expansion files, details, APKs, everything is there. And how do you start a project? So the library, the publisher library, um, as I said, we're going to use the Java version of it. It's being uh, distributed via Gradle and also in the Maven Central. You can always download the jars and put it on your project if you want to, but like, it's, it's a lot easier to use Gradle. We are used to, to do that already on Android, so you're just going to copy that line. Currently, they have like the revision 41, but this is always being updated, so keep an eye. Maybe this is already outdated. I think, I, yeah, I got that like two weeks ago, so maybe it's already outdated. Um, so when, when you put that into your project, you're going to be able to access um, the, Google, the Google credentials and, and build uh, the key to communicate with, your, with uh, Google Play Console. So the first thing uh, you have to do, I don't want to go through like, all the details of the code, but uh, in general lines, you're going to create this Google credential uh, object that takes a transport, uh, HTTP transport, and also a JSON library to parse. The, the, the JSON that is the communication between the, la the REST API. As I said, uh, everything is on top of a REST API, so you could build your own. This is just a helper from Google, so you don't have to handle all the OAuth and the, the problems with authentication, because it's a little cumbersome, I would say. I tried to do that myself, and it's like you have to request a token and then get it back, save it locally, and then perform all your requests with that token. The, the library that they, that they provide to us, encapsulates everything, so we don't have to care about that. Uh, important parts about the credential is that you have to set those three fields. Those three fields are the fields that we got from the key previously from the console. So since you have saved th that JSON file, you're just going to put that, those fields, the service account email, and the keys uh, to authenticate your robot to talk to the Google Play Developer Console. So once you have the credential, we can finally instantiate the publisher. So you just pass in some objects over there, and you set the application name uh, as, a, as an attribute. So this application name is the identifier of your app on the Google Play. So in, in case of, of SoundCloud, it would be com.soundcloud.android. In, in case of your application, you just put it in uh, the package of your application. 
um, and and this could be dynamic. So like if you if you want to update many different uh, applications at once using the same mechanism, you can just like change this package value, and everything is going to go to the right place. So app edits. This is the core of the library, and this is how the library works for everything that you want to change uh, on the Google Play Console. Um, the idea be behind app edits is that they're going to work just like a Git tree. So you're going to make it. You're going to start a change in your project. You're going to make a change, a second change, a third change, a fourth change, and then finally you're going to commit those changes, and that's going to work just like a database transaction. It's either 100%. Or zero percent. It it's either successful or not successful, and then everything is rolled back. So the idea of, of the app app edits is that you're gonna insert uh, an app edit on the tree, insert many of them, and then commit them at once. Uh, in this example here, um, I'm going to insert an app edit on my for for my package that's defined by that value over there, the the package constant. Um, and then I'm going to get this field, which is the transaction ID, which is exactly what I say when I mean, when I mean like git commits. So this is, uh, works just like the git hash that you have for each commit. And you're going to reference this app edit by this transaction ID for the run. We're going to see. So after you do all your changes, so after you insert or delete or like change all the resources you want, in the end you validate and commit um, the changes. What's the difference between validate and commit? So the thing about the, the publishing API is that because of Google Play has many um, requirements and also things that you have to keep in mind, rules that you have to follow, uh, it's always good to validate your changes before you actually commit them. So an example I can give you, and I think I have a slide for that. Let's see. Yeah. So if you try to, to set a description, a full description that is like 10,000 characters or like a million characters, then this is not possible via the Google Play web, desk, uh, web interface. And this is also not possible via the API. So you're going to have a, an error like this, a 403 error. Um, in, in this case, if you just use the commit, um, the commit message, the commit method, I'm sorry, uh, you're going to get this error. And after this point, the connection to the API is closed immediately. But if you use the validate one, then you get the error and you're able to parse it. So this is very useful if you want to build a robot and report errors back to your CI pipeline. So let's say someone tries to, so if you're developing like an app that have to be under a given like size, so like let's say up to 20 megabytes, if you can develop a robot that will check the APK size after it's uploaded to the, to the Google Play developer, uh, to the Google Play store, uh, check that size and then report back to your CI pipeline if you go through this size. So it's, it's, it gives you lots of flexibility in matter of reporting errors back. So my, yeah, so a rule of thumb is always validate your commits before you actually execute the commit action. Right, this is an example of how we update a listing. So the listing is just a description of the app, right? So when you update a new APK, you have the opportunity to say what's new on that APK. Um, so your users can follow the release notes. Uh, and this is how you would um, select one, uh, update one listing on the store. So just going really quick through the code, you're going to create a new edit, which is a new app edit, access the listings resource, um, and then using the transaction ID, as you can see there, using the transaction ID, you're going to get the listings from your APK and then set the full description. It's just a setter as any other. And up to that point, up to, up to the moment you call update, nothing happens on the real production um, APK that's there. Nothing happens until you do the commit. Um, yeah, an interesting detail, and the, the, the reason I marked that get method over there as red is because you can have multiple APKs for different locales, for example. So uh, in the case that I mentioned before, um, you would get, like, when you access this resource listings, you would have actually a list of listings. And this list of listings is nothing more than a list of locales. So if you, in our case on SoundCloud, we, like, we distribute the app for the United States, but also for Netherlands and also for Germany, when you have like different APKs, um, you would access the listings using this key, so the locale in this situation. And in the end, so after you update everything and you execute those methods, you validate and commit to make the changes. Yeah, this is one example of uh, the resource that you get. So 
Uh, for the listings, you have access to the full description, language, short description, title, and video. If you go to the link uh, over there on the top right, you can, you can see like the full uh, details of every single resource. So you can, get, you can have access to many properties of your APKs, like the size, like the language, also the number of screenshots, and everything else, including details of the developer if you want to dynamically change the address or the contact us email. So this is an interesting example of how you would uh, finally upload a new APK to the store. Uh, just like before, instead of accessing the listings resource, we're going to access the APKs resource. And we're going to we're going to upload a new APK to the store. So uh, this APK object uh, is a representation of our APK on the Google Play Store. And just as before, nothing happens before we do validate and commit, but they keep a local uh, a local uh, representation of your changes with the library and you can access that while you're doing your changes and then finally you validate and commit. Um, so an example of, of, of um, property that you, you could access here is the version code of the APK just before you upload it. Um, another, another interesting detail is about the execute method. So if you, if you look into the third line there, like many of the other lines that I've showed before, they have this execute method. It's important to know that this is a synchronous call, uh, and they don't provide an asynchronous call, which means if you're developing an actual bot or an actual um, um, automated pipeline or something, you have to make sure you don't call this in a thread that is a problematic thread to be blocked. Um, I, yeah, I had a demo to be presented here, but like, since I didn't know exactly how the internet was going to be, I cut it out. But in my demo, in my present, like the demo that I'm, I'm going to post the link later for you to see, I'm doing everything on the same thread um, that you execute the code, which means it gets blocked. So until the request comes back, everything gets blocked. Right, so you got, so let's say you uploaded your APK, you got the version code, what do you do next? Let's say I want to set this APK to a given uh, release track. So let's say I want to put it on the alpha track or on the beta track. Uh, this is the same, like just the same as before, you can see the, the code block is pretty similar as before. You access the tracks resource and you set the information over there. So you're gonna uh, instantiate a new track, set the version code that you just got from the previous, um, the previous operation and finally, you're going to update that track, the track ID value, um, with the APK you just uploaded. So this track ID is exactly what you expect. It's a string that can represent alpha, beta, rollout, or production. And this rollout one is special because it represents the stage rollout. Um, and in this track, you also have like this extra property called user fraction that you can set um, to represent the user fraction you want to distribute to. So it can be 1%, 5%, 10%, the fractions that you're already um, used to. Of course, if you try to be smart and use a fraction that is not available on Google Play, so like, for example, 75%, you're going to get an error. Right. Just, this is just another example of how we can access the resources of the, of the, REST, APK, the, the REST API. Uh, and here I'm up updating the APK listing to say what's changed uh, in this recent release regarding this APK. That's, that's pretty much it. As you can see, um, the three blocks are very similar. You pretty much access a resource, perform your changes, and then execute the request. That's all. After all of that, if you, commit, if you validate and commit your changes, then it's going to be live on production. It's pretty simple. For the reviews, so this is, yeah, as I said, this is a new one. They added it this year. Um, but it's just like the, the, the other ones. I'm feeling like I'm repeating myself here, but you pretty much just access the resource, the reviews, and you can list the reviews based on your package. You can also get a single review by ID. Uh, and then finally, you can also, uh, this is like the, the attributes that you have access to, so author name, review ID, comments. Um, and you can also reply to those reviews. So uh, you could, we, we, uh, we didn't, do this in SoundCloud. We didn't do. I didn't do this yet, but it's on our roadmap actually to build a bot where we could reply to reviews via Slack, which would be great. Right. So there is the REST API. There is the clients like the Java, Python, and Ruby clients. But do we have to do this? Honestly, like there is a, a very nice Jenkins plugin that already encapsulates everything, 
And there is also a Gradle plugin that you can use that encapsulates everything in the library. And that's why I, I asked in the beginning if uh, on the workshop that you had, uh, the CI workshop that happened yesterday, if you have used this API explicitly. And the answer is no. The thing is that most people don't use the API explicitly because those plugins, they are very good. And they encapsulate everything. Um, the Gradle plugin, actually, it's amazing because it reads stuff from your project automatically. You can set the screenshots uh, on the project, uh, the project structure, and also the, the recent changes could be written, re read uh, by a text file that you have in your project. Honestly, I don't recommend using the API unless you want to do something more complex or more uh, like some fine tuning or something like different, like integrating with a chatbot or something. Uh, for every other major case, like every like the majority of the people using Jenkins, the Jenkins plugin or Gradle plugin, it's enough. So if you're thinking into like just checking out the API, seeing how it works, if you can integrate it with your current workflow, then my recommendation is go with the Gradle plugin and try it out. And if you want to do something more specific, then you can dive into the actual API. And then I've had this, so I've presented this talk already other times, and then I've had this one guy. Um, that asked me like after I finish it. So if we have those things, why did you say all this bullshit since the beginning? Like just give me the link to the plugin and use it. Well, this is just more like as a curiosity, you know. Like it's especially when you're dealing with production, like with the re your release and how you uh, how your users are gonna get your stuff. It's very important that you know what's happening behind the curtains. So I really recommend if you want to go into the publishing API, the, the code is open source, so you can go into it and try to understand how it works. Uh, and you can build, like in the end, you're going to be able to build your own custom thing that's, that fits exactly your needs. Um, so this is my tip. So if you're messing with the production, if you're messing with uh, your real users, make sure you know what you're doing and don't put any code over there because you could just, yeah, you could cause problems. Right. In the end, yeah, that's, so that's the goal. Like currently, <laughs> that's uh, the state that we have currently at the company. Someone changes something. Uh, Jenkins already builds our, our um, pull requests and runs all the automated testing, automated UI testing and everything. And we immediately send all those changes that are merged into the master branch to our alpha users. So um, would, would we put it in production for 100% of the users, I would say better not to. Uh, in SoundCloud, we have this alpha group uh, that we, we use uh, Fabric to do so, but you can also do like via Google Play. Uh, and we send these new changes to all of our internal uh, employees every day. So everything that's new that happens on the master branch and gets merged on it goes immediately to our users and we have testing over there, like internally. Uh, once we think it's mature enough and it's stable enough, like every once or two, or, or two weeks, we send that to the beta track and also then later we go via stage rollout to the full user base. Um, so once uh, I was al al also like talking to um, another person in a previous time, I, I gave this speech and um, they asked me like, would you go to a full production like if you, if you push to master, would you go to the user base if you don't have an alpha group or a beta testing group? And my answer is, depends. Uh, it really depends. I mean, I'm, from, I'm originally from Brazil, and there the network is very, very expensive, and it's very bad for you to make your users download new stuff every day. So like, my recommendation, especially if you're targeting those markets, is to not push updates every, every once a day or like every once a week, because maybe that's too much. But for alpha users, then I think it's fine. You know, even for beta users, they know that they might get uh, some broken stuff here and there, or like multiple updates once in a day. So I'm all for it. Like I'm, I really recommend you do, to do that. So if you have like a, an alpha community or a beta community, go for it. Continuous deployment will make your life a lot easier because you're going to have less uh, a smaller feedback cycle, and you're going to be able to catch bugs early on. Uh, and if you don't, then do and create a beta testing community because it's so useful. Like we got, we on SoundCloud have many safety nets before we go to full production, and the beta community is one is a big one. We have like really hard users uh, that are part of it, um, and they help us a lot with like bug reports, and we have like those crashes that Fabric catches before we go to full production. 
Also, I recommend you, like, if, you, if you're interested in becoming a beta user, you can talk to me later, and then I'm going to add you to the, to the community. So this is the, the website, and I put a QR code there because I know it's hard to, to copy stuff. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the slides later as well. So in this website, uh, I have a sample project that uses the, the publishing API to be automatically pushed to, to the Google Play Developer Console. And it's, it's very simple, just a simple project that, put, that prints the version of the app to the screen. And uh, I have, a, besides that one, I have another project that uses the publishing API to push that Android project to the store. So you can access that one, check it out, look at the code. Uh, also submit pull requests if you think there's something new that we can add. Um, yeah, take a picture of the QR code and then, or then come to me later for the slides. Okay, so this is the time I do some advertising. Um, we have, yeah, we have open spots at SoundCloud, so if you're interested into like Android, of course, but if you're interested into other technologies, iOS as well, um, we, we are based in Berlin, uh, but we have like, we have Android engineering roles open. Uh, currently the app, we have uh, more than 6,000 unit tests and two, 250 UI tests. It's a pretty big code base, so if you're into uh, challenges with Android and challenges with scalability. And also, if you're into music, come to me later, let's talk, and then um, we can talk about like a, uh, a place for you in the team. That's it. Thank you very much. Those are my, my contacts.